preaching to the Yopros. I oversee the young professionals at our church, and so I organized our retreat and had, well, I didn't organize it. The leaders of the young professionals organized it. I just got the speaker. That's all I was responsible for. Well, I even messed that up because I told Aaron um, the wrong dates, and so he thought that he would be back here for Sunday. And then this week, he found out he wasn't going to be here for this Sunday. And so I said, hey, listen, this is my fault. I'll be there on Sunday. I'll preach for you. You're up there for me. I'll be here for you. And so that's why I'm here. And so I, I, I owed it to him. It's my fault. So thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to have the privilege of opening God's word to you. So let's turn to John chapter 10, a beloved passage for I'm sure many of you. John chapter 10, the whole chapter, but we're going to be focusing on verses 27 through 30. Thank you again for letting Aaron come up to the conference. It's, he's blessed us tremendously. A lot of great feedback from all of the group. Uh, we have about 40 young professionals, and uh, they, most of them are able to come up to this retreat, and they've all been blessed. They've all been, uh, a lot of them have been letting me know how blessed they've been with Aaron and his family there. So thank you for allowing him to come up and bless us. And so we've been, and I'm just thankful for my relationship with Aaron. He's a, a dear brother, and I'm uh, thankful for his ministry to you. He loves you. He speaks very highly of this church, and he loves pastoring here. So um, thank you again for letting us have him for a little bit. Let's turn to John chapter 10. I want to talk about the assurance of salvation. That's what I want to talk about today, uh, an important topic for all Christians. And you may be uh, wondering how it is, or some of you might be wondering, is it possible to have assurance of salvation? Does God even want us to have assurance? Do you just kind of make it your way through life without assurance, and then you kind of you find out whether you're saved when you stand before the Lord uh, that's not God's will for us. He wills for us to have sal- uh, assurance of salvation, as we'll see in multiple texts, including this one. But I want us to address this issue because, as you know, this is a foundational issue. You're, you can't really build a Christian life without this solid foundation of the assurance of your salvation, as we'll see. Some of you, I'm, I'm sure some of you, if not many of you, have, have been to San Francisco before, and you may have seen the Millennium uh, Tower. It is uh, new, it's relatively new, it was built in 2008, and uh, a, an incredible building, a, lug, a luxury uh, condo building, and entry levels about, to step into one of these condos is about $1.6 million, and you could go all the way up to $10 million if you wanted the nicest uh, condo in this Millennium Tower. In fact, you may have known a few people who have lived there before. Joe Montana has lived there before. I don't think he lives there anymore. Uh, Hunter Pence, who is a famous baseball player for the Giants, previously for the Giants, he used to live there. I don't know if he lives there anymore. A venture capitalist named Tom Perkins, he's lived there. I don't know if he's lived there anymore. And the reason why I don't know if these famous people have lived there, if they live there anymore is because ever since it's been built in 2008, it's slowly been sinking and tilting. If, you, if you're aware of this, it's, it's quite remarkable that you have this beautiful, massive building which cost hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars to even complete. It, it, it features a fitness center, a wine cellar and tasting room. It, it features a, an indoor pool. It features a movie theater and these incredibly luxurious condos that can go from $1.6 to $10 million that have brought in the likes of Joe Montana, Hunter Pence, and venture capitalists. And I don't know if they're still there because you may not want to, no matter how much you paid for a place, you may not want to stay in a building that is literally tilting. And it was tilting 17 inches in 2011. To this day, in 2022, is now tilting 28 inches. Isn't that remarkable? I know you read that and you're like, I can't even believe it. You spend all that money. Well, now they're trying to shore up this foundation problem, and they're trying to get it to, to slowly tilt the other way. Again, this is just so beyond my pay grade. I can't even begin to fathom how you even do this, but they're trying to get underneath the foundation, and they are in process of a $100 million foundation repair on this building, and it's run into problems, and I'm going to read this quote from uh, an article describing it. This is a really recent article. It said, the seemingly unending saga of San Francisco's lopsided luxury skyscraper, the Millennium Tower, may have hit another wall this week, literally. 
The underground shoring wall buried deep in the uh, Soma soil, which Soma is just a clever way of saying south of market. So I didn't know that until I read this article and looked it up. But that's where it's located, south of Market Street. And it's threatening to hinder the $100 million effort to right the sinking property, marking the latest problem in the beleaguered fix to, on the tower. That fix, termed the perimeter pile upgrade, began work last year. But the presence of a three-foot thick, 90-foot steel and cement underground wall installed as part of the earth retention system during the original tower build to enable construction of the five-story deep parking garage next door may stop the plan, according to experts. So they are trying to repair this foundation, and all of a sudden they're bumping up against this major retaining wall that was put in originally, and now they're not sure what they're going to do. And meanwhile, you've got a massive luxurious, beautiful building that is tilting 28 inches and causing people to move out. It's a, it's a big problem, and it just highlights the, the, the issue and the importance of foundations, right? That's all that is meant to do. It's to highlight the importance of foundations, and just as true as that is in the physical world, so it is in the spiritual world. We can't build the structure of our Christian life on a wobbly foundation, a cracking foundation, a settling foundation, and that foundation is the assurance of your salvation. We will find great difficulty in making much of any progress in our Christian life without being assured that we belong to Jesus Christ, that we will enter into glory when we die, that he holds us in his arms, and that is certain. Without that assurance, something that God does intend for us to have, as we'll see in a little bit, we can't make much progress in our Christian life. And so that's why I want to address this issue. It's important, it's foundational, it's essential. And I, I hope and pray that it will be a blessing to you. Some of you, maybe for you to step into new vistas of assurance that you haven't had before, and for others of you to dig down, drill down even deeper and to secure that assurance even more than it was coming in here today. So that is my goal. I want to be God's instrument to help bolster your assurance of salvation so that you can live a life that is free from the anxiety of whether or not you are going to heaven and for that reason then be able to give your life in service and ministry to Christ and to others. So let's get our contextual bearings. If you look with me here in chapter 10 verse 22, it's going to tell us where we're at here in the Gospels. It says in verse 22, he says, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. The Feast of Dedication was simply a celebration in Israel of the rededication of the temple This years and years ago, after in 164 BC, it had been desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes, and it was reclaimed by Judas Maccabeus. And so ever since that reclamation by Judas Maccabeus in Israel, the temple that had been previously desecrated, they had celebrated the Feast of Dedication. We otherwise know it as, know it as Hanukkah. But that's what was going on here in its winter time. And it says that Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And when you think of pictures of the temple, you might be thinking of the the, the, the major structure and the courtyard and then the, the holy place and the holy of holies. Well, this was a, a section that was probably a covered area with, with columns. And because it was winter, Jesus is there because it would have just been a better place to hang out and teach than being out in the open where it's cold. So this is not probably in the courtyard. This is in a, a covered area, a colonnade as it's called. And, and the Jews are gathering around him and they're asking him questions. And they're asking him one specific question here in this case and they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And you might be thinking, well, that's a fair question. I mean, come on, Jesus. Let us know. I mean, if you really are, you should, you should let us know. And that, that would, might seem like a fair question. The problem is, is up to this point, Jesus has, in fact, showed, it, showed them quite clearly that he is the Messiah. Just as an example, in John 3.18 and John 5.25, he's referred to himself already as the Son of God. And this phrase, Son of God, would have had messianic overtones based on Psalm 2, based on 2 Samuel 7, where there's the promise of this son who is going to reign on David's throne. And so he's already referred to himself as the, 
Son of God. In fact, he even says that in verse 25. He says, I told you, you don't believe. So it's not as though he's hiding these things. He's telling them. He's addressing the issue. And he's even doing works that attest to this very thing. Look at verse 25, the latter part of verse 25. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. So he has said that he is the Son of God. And now he is doing, he's been doing remarkable works up to this point that indicate clearly that he is the Messiah. Again, as an example, the wedding in Cana, water into wine, a remarkable miracle. Chapter 5 in John, he heals an invalid who is either paralyzed or extremely weak and feeble, for he had been that way for at least 38 years. Jesus heals him, a remarkable creation miracle, you might say. The only way that this man could have gotten up and walked is something vital happened in his body to repair his inability to get up and walk. And in fact, that's what Jesus does. He heals this man. He feeds 5,000 people. Well, he feeds 5,000 men. It was likely that it was 20,000 people, including women and children. He had done that in John 6. Need I go on? I will. John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man blind from birth. So this, this is not a legit question. This question isn't genuine, it's disingenuous. They are not interested in learning whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, they've already determined that they want him out of their hair, out of their business, right? Uh, for example, in John 5, 18, John writes, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, or so they thought, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. And so they had had enough. Jesus was a nuisance. He was taking away from their glory. That was one of the biggest problems. And what they saw what he was doing is actually blasphemous. And then in John 7, 32, the Pharisees and the priests were seeking to arrest him. And then in John 5, 8, 30, or John 5, or John 8, 58 and 59, they are ready to stone him because he had just called himself the I am of the Old Testament, Yahweh of the Old Testament. So they've already made up their mind with Jesus. This question is disingenuous. It's not legitimate. But Jesus is going to respond to them by revealing the root of what's really going on. The root of the problem was not that they didn't have enough evidence. That wasn't the problem. And that is never the problem. It's just as a side note. When when you're dealing with people in your life who don't know Jesus, who don't believe in Jesus, who have yet to bow the knee to Jesus, and yet you've spent days and months and perhaps even years compiling all the evidence that you can for the, the deity and the reality of Jesus in the gospel, and they continue to refuse, you might be thinking, well, maybe I just haven't given enough evidence. Maybe the evidence I've been giving isn't good enough. What Jesus reveals here is that evidence isn't the issue. The issue is unbelief. That's the issue. The issue is the human heart that's been darkened by sin, that needs the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ to shine in. The, the problem is not evidence. The problem is the human heart. Unbelief was the fundamental disposition of these religious leaders to Jesus, and so every bit of evidence that Jesus himself or anybody else could give would just glance right off their heart. And so it is with the unbelievers in our life that despite all the evidence we can muster from every corner of creation and every corner of the Bible, as the heart is remaining in unbelief, all of that evidence will glance off and not find root. But you might be wondering, what was the cause of the unbelief? And that would be a really good question. What was the cause of the unbelief? Is there a deeper root than just the unbelief? And I think there is. For example, in John 5, 44, Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. And he says, you study the scriptures over and over and on and on. You've, you've got them practically memorized. But you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And then he says in later in uh, chapter 5, verse 44, he says, How can you believe when you seek the glory 
that comes from man and not the glory that comes from God. One of the deep roots of their unbelief was the fact that they had a love affair with the praise of man. Jesus' words in John 5, reveal that a person who is in love with getting glory from other people is someone in whose heart unbelief will prevail. Faith in Jesus cannot reside in the heart that loves the praise of men. It's like oil and water. You can't bring those two things together. And so John, Jesus reveals in John 5, that their unbelief was rooted in this love affair they had with the praise of men. These Pharisees, these religious leaders, lived for the praise of man. All their works, their religious deeds, as you see in Matthew 6, they did it so that people would see them and say, hey, they're pretty awesome. They're pretty godly. And Jesus is saying, a heart like that is unable to believe in me. So one of the roots of this unbelief was, in fact, their pride. But there's a deeper root than even that, believe it or not. A deeper root than even that. And this, this statement here is a little unnerving by Jesus. Because what it does is it reveals the sovereignty of God over our salvation. As we'll see, that's actually good news for us. But for these religious leaders, it would have been shocking. Jesus here is going to give the deepest root for why the Jews were walking in unbelief. He's going to give them the most foundation, foundational reason why every bit of evidence that Jesus used to affirm his identity was just glancing off their heart. What was this base, deepest root? It was this, verse 26. You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Now, this should have been shocking to them, and this is probably jarring for us to hear. You might expect them to say, you're not my sheep because you don't believe. That would make sense. But here it's the case that they are not believing because they are not part of Jesus' fold, a fold that he himself has received from the Father, a gift from the Father, and his point is that you're not believing in me because you're not part of this fold. Jesus had given them plenty of evidence in order for them to rightly identify and embrace him, but they didn't believe because they were not among his sheep. What does this mean? What does it mean that he wasn't among their sheep? Well, let's look in verse 27 because he's going to tell us what it means. What does it look like to be one of Jesus' sheep, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. They were unable to hear the shepherd's voice. And this was an indication that they did not belong to Jesus. They did not recognize their shepherd. They did not gravitate towards their shepherd. They were not only spiritually blind, but they were spiritually deaf. As Jesus instructs his, uh, these religious leaders, his true disciples here, as he's now instructing the religious leaders, but also now directing important truths to his disciples, he's going to give them precious, precious words about the assurance of their salvation. So he's addressing the religious leaders, but at the same time, he's teaching his disciples and giving us precious promises and truths about the assurance of our salvation. Jesus' disciples, and let's just be clear, Jesus' disciples are meant to have the assurance of their salvation. If you are a believer in Jesus here this morning, you need to know that God has designed salvation specifically so that you would have assurance. Assurance is not some icing on the cake of Christianity. God has designed our salvation so that we would have assurance. Just think of it with me for a moment. God planned salvation from before the foundation of the world. Then as he sets things in motion in the world, he sends his son to bear all the punishment and to achieve all the righteousness for our need and for our salvation in our place. He does it all. He completes it all. He lives a perfect life in our place. He fulfills all righteousness in our place. He dies in our place. He rises in our place. And then the Spirit comes along and unites you to Jesus and enables you to believe. And then empowers you to bear the fruit of good works and to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And then, to top it all off, God gives you promise after promise after promise after promise that He will not leave you nor forsake you. You will not be snatched away from Him. You cannot be lost. 
Even the greatest trials cannot cause you to lose your salvation. The entire scheme of salvation was designed by God for the express purpose of giving his people assurance. Why? Because a person who is assured of their salvation will live to the hilt for the glory of God. If you are sure that you, upon your death, will inherit everything, you can give away everything here in this life. So that is why God has designed salvation with this very thing in mind. How God has planned and brought about salvation was specifically to provide you with assurance. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. There are plenty of people today, professing Christians, who would like you to believe that you're not meant to have assurance of your salvation. It's a lie, as we'll see here in a little bit. So here Jesus is going to give us seven foundational truths on which to build rock-solid assurance. And you might be thinking, Derek, you're only supposed to have three points in a sermon. I apologize. There's going to be seven today. Some of them will be shorter than the others. But this is probably, if I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. You, you don't want to say any one truth in the Bible is your favorite, but I really, really love this next one. The first one is this. Jesus' sheep hear their shepherd's voice. That's number one. This is the this, this, uh, first foundational truth. Jesus' sheep hear their shepherd's voice. The most basic aspect of assurance is the truth that you in the scriptures are able to hear Jesus' voice. What are we talking about? Are we talking about an audible voice? Like you're driving down the road and you hear Jesus speaking to you and you're like, oh, I better turn here because Jesus said to do that. No, that's not what we're referring to. He's talking about a spiritual reception of his voice in the scripture. There's a resonating You hear the word, you read the word, and you're like, that's my shepherd, that's Jesus, and you'll never persuade me otherwise. You could bring every sophisticated argument you want. I know my shepherd. I know that's true. And you know, I really, I love this aspect of Christianity. When Christ's sheep hear his word preached, when they read it in the Bible, they hear Christ, they know it's real, and they know it's true. And and it's just, it's just funny because you, I know people and their testimony is this. I was reading the Bible and I realized, hey, it's true. This is true. And then, and then they, and they believe it and then they, and they're saved. And, and then you might ask them, okay, tell me why you're a Christian. Give me a list of 10 sophisticated reasons why you are a Christian. And they, and they're like, because it's true? I mean, what else do you want me to say, right? And that's the right answer. They've read it. They hear their shepherd's voice. They hear these truths preached from the gospel, and you're like, it's true. Why don't you believe, right? Why don't you believe it's true? And that's what Jesus is getting after. It's a very simple thing. My sheep hear my voice. You're a Christian here today Not because you're more wise than other people, not because you have located some sort of secret bit of evidence locked over here in a corner, not because you have come down a long list of logical inferences and you can put it all together. You're a Christian today because it's true and you hear your shepherd's voice in the word of God. That's why you're a Christian. You don't have to have a long, sophisticated list of reasons. You don't need access to every bit of historical evidence You're a Christian today because you know it's true, because you hear your shepherd's voice in the word of God, and that is a foundational piece to your assurance. Do you hear Christ in the scriptures? It's because you hear your shepherd's voice. Only his sheep can hear the shepherd. We just see that, have seen that with his response to the religious leaders. Only his sheep can hear the shepherd's voice. If you can hear the shepherd's voice, you belong to Jesus Christ. He is your shepherd. Only Jesus' sheep can hear his voice. Your basic ability to hear Christ in the scriptures is meant to be one of the primary footings in the foundation of your assurance. It's not sophisticated. It's not elaborate. You hear the word preached. You read the word. You hear Jesus. There it is. Praise God for that. I love this about Christianity. To the, to the wise God, to those who are wise and 
and think they can figure it all out, think, figure all the spiritual things out, and they can figure it out apart from God, God closes the door of truth and revelation. But to the simple and to the dependent, he opens wide the door. And it's a simple thing. Why do you believe? Because it's true. I love it. Number two, Jesus' sheep are known personally by their shepherd. This is the second important piece in the foundation. He says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and I know them. Jesus Christ knows you, and he doesn't know you like he knows all 170 billion people who have ever lived. That's an estimate. I don't know if that's actually how many, but that's, that's an estimate of all the people that have ever lived, ever He knows all of them. He created all of them. But that's not what he means here. Jesus has a special knowledge of his sheep, a knowledge that only the shepherd can have, a knowledge of only one who has given his life for them can have. It's it's similar to the way I feel about my kids. Now, we have really cute kids at our church, all right? And you can come and check it out. I'm not lying. We've got a lot of cute kids at our church. And I love all of them. But I don't love them the way I love my kids. When I am watching uh, one of my son's uh, football games or soccer games, guess who I'm watching? My eyes are on him the whole time. When my son, Easton, my uh, middle son, Easton's coming from, uh, out of school, out of the classroom, I'm picking him up. Who do I see? I just see him. There are a lot of cute kids around. That's cool. But I only see him. When my daughter is dancing on the stage and, and dancing with all the kindergarten and first grade little girls doing their ballet thing, or, or trying to do their ballet thing, I, all the kids are cute, it's wonderful, but I have my eye on one little girl. Why? Because she's my daughter. I have a, a particular affection for her that I don't have for every other child. I have my eye on her, and that's the way Jesus knows his sheep. He has an eye on his sheep. He knows them, not in the way that he knows everyone as their creator, but he knows his sheep in a special way as their shepherd. In a book that describes this kind of metaphor that scripture uses for the the shepherd-sheep relationship, it says this, says, quote, responsible shepherds know every member of their flocks in terms of their birth circumstances, history of health, eating habits, and other idiosyncrasies. It is not uncommon to name each goat and sheep and to call them by name. One of the most striking characteristics of the shepherd-flock relationship is that control over the flock is exercised, exercised by simply the sound of the shepherd's voice or whistle. Why? Because he knows them and they know him. As your shepherd, Jesus prays and intercedes for your well-being. As your shepherd, he looks out specifically for your spiritual well-being. He is never far away, though at times it may feel like that. He has promised you he will never leave you nor forsake you. He knows you. He knows you personally. He knows you intimately. He has chosen you to be his He will never leave you nor forsake you. And even those troubles that he has brought you into, those trying difficulties, those mind-bending difficulties and sufferings, he's even brought brought you into those situations the entire time with his eye on you, not not to harm you, but to refine you. That's your shepherd. My my sheep hear my voice and I know them. Isn't it incredible that you are known by the creator, not merely as a creature, but as a beloved child, a beloved sheep in his pasture? He laid his life down for you. That's number two. Number three, Jesus' sheep hear his voice. He knows them. This is number three. And they follow me. And they follow me. As a result of our ability to hear our shepherd's voice and our personal relationship with him, we follow Jesus. Not perfectly. I love the expression, it's not about the perfection of your life, it's the direction of your life. We don't follow him perfectly, but we do follow him. There is a, this resonating of Jesus' voice compels us out 
to begin to follow him. Our hearts have been changed by faith. God has cleansed our hearts through this relationship. Before our conversion, we either adamantly rejected Jesus Christ or we were just indifferent to him. And now we have a desire to follow after Christ and to walk in his ways. We're not saved by our works, of course. But our salvation evidences itself in our desire to and our actual walking in obedience to Jesus. The genuineness of our faith will flow out into obedience to Christ. The same Apostle John, who wrote this passage, in recording Jesus' words, also wrote this in 1 John 2, 4-5. through Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so this hearing of Jesus' voice leads to an obedience, not a begrudging obedience. A challenging obedience sometimes, yes. Difficult, yes. But an obedience, an obedience that is supplied and enabled by God's own spirit. So there is a change, there is a following. It's a following of that voice, a following of that voice in the word of God. It's God's design that you would have assurance of your salvation, and a piece of that, it's not the biggest piece, but a piece of that is our walking in faith and obedience. There are bigger pieces, but that is certainly a piece of it. Following our shepherd affirms and deepens our assurance that we know his voice and have heard it. Let me say that again. Following our shepherd in obedience affirms and deepens our assurance that we know and hear his voice. So we do need to walk in obedience. We need to hear his word and and apply it. Number four. Number four. See, I told you some of these were going to go quickly. So no no worries. Number four. Jesus' sheep are eternally safe. This next verse decimates any idea, any teaching any suggestion that a Christian can lose their salvation. It's almost as though Jesus knew exactly what people were going to teach in the future and then said this verse. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. What kind of eternal life? I don't know, the eternal kind, right? <laughs> Listen to these words from John five twenty four. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. Jesus, what does that mean? This is what it means. He does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. To suggest that you can lose your salvation is to say that you can go from death to life back to death again. And that would undermine the entire structure of the New Testament. Jesus says you have passed from death into life. This is the kind of eternal life that you do not perish. And so this is great. He goes, I give them eternal life. And you can just hear it in, in the back. Well, you could, what kind of eternal life do you mean, Jesus? Well, this kind, the kind where they will never perish ever. So how is it that a person can be raised spiritually, made one of Jesus's sheep, given eternal life, and then lose that. It goes against everything that Jesus just said in this passage. We have to remain firm here. This is a place where I believe that Satan has had a field day. Not only has he found a way to formalize this teaching among professing Christians that you can lose your salvation, but then we begin to believe it ourselves. And so he has to come and say things like, I give them eternal life, the eternal kind, and this is the kind that it is, they will never perish. If you belong to Christ, if you've been saved, you will never perish. This is a bedrock of assurance. You can't come into final condemnation if you've been given eternal life. You cannot perish. And we just have to meditate upon these truths until we believe them. Don't don't mistake the Christian life for 
an easy walk in the park. There are truths in the Christian life that we have to meditate upon until they get into our hearts. And Satan would love for us to become confused at this point. Just a seed of doubt, that's all you need. Just a seed of doubt that says, oh, maybe I could be lost. Maybe, that, maybe I could, maybe I could lose my salvation. And then psh, he doesn't need to do much else. If he can get that into your mind, maybe I can lose my salvation, then he can, just, he can leave you on your own and go find someone else to bother. Because now there will be anxiety. Now there will be a lack of assurance. And not only that, you know your own sinful heart. And you know that if salvation could be lost, you would lose it. And so would I. And so Satan, once he plants that seed, he's off to somebody else. So we need to meditate on these truths until we believe them. And then we need to ask the Lord, help my unbelief. And then we need to continue to meditate on them. Salvation cannot be lost. We don't have a Savior who will let us go. We have a Savior who we sing about it. I'm sure you sing about it. A Savior who does not let us go, who will not let us go. That is the salvation that he has wrought. Even the warnings in Scripture, this is an important piece, even the warnings in the New Testament of what will happen if you walk away, those are given to enable you to keep believing because that's how Jesus holds on to you. He even gives you severe warnings, believe it or not, Jesus in his love gives you severe warnings in the New Testament to keep you in the faith. Thank you, Lord. Why? Because you can't be lost. And that's one of the means that he keeps you from walking away. He gives you these warnings. He gives you encouragements. He gives you the church. He gives you preaching. He gives you books. He gives you friends. He gives you all that you need so that you will continue to persevere in the faith. They will never perish. But here's a, uh, an important thing to cons- consider. I, you know, I've heard this before, and, and I'm, I think that this kind of teaching has come out of the Roman Catholic Church. I grew up Roman Catholic, and I believe this is, is something that they formalized in their own teaching. The idea that it's almost presumptuous to have assurance of salvation. It's prideful. It's proud. How could you... How could you think such a thing, that you are saved and that you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And, and then there's people that I've met where they think it's just fine as a Christian. You just kind of live without assurance and it's not something you were ever meant to have and you just make your way through the Christian life. I even had a roommate in college who kind of thought like this. And it's just, it's just surprising to me. Um, but let me remind us, for those of us who might be tempted to think that way, let me remind us that without a firm assurance that we belong to Christ, we won't have assurance of his power residing in us. And if we don't have assurance of his power residing in us, then we will labor in our own strength. That's, that's what will happen. When we labor in our own strength, we will end up picking and choosing what commands we want to obey and which ones we don't want to obey. Because we'll be relying on our own strength. We, and we will end up choosing the easier commands or we will perform the spiritual duties that tend to get us most recognition. Without assurance, we will inevitably become self-righteous and proud, ironically. It's ironic because those who say that assurance of salvation is presumptuous and an indication that you think too highly of yourself, it's actually the exact opposite. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. It's precisely because I know how sinful that I am that I need assurance. When you claim that a Christian cannot have assurance, you are claiming that you have the ability to withstand the trials that attend the Christian life and to fulfill Christ's commands without the assurance of his power and presence. If that's not arrogance, I don't know what is. When you are saying that a Christian cannot have assurance, you are saying that you in your own strength and power can withstand all the trials of this life, and there are many, and fulfill all the commands of the Bible and there, of the New Testament, and there are many. You're saying you can do that in all your own strength. That is the very definition of arrogance. So don't let anybody fool you into thinking that having assurance is presumptuous or proud. It is the exact opposite. My Lord, I need assurance because of how weak I am. I need to know that you hold on to me, that I am yours, not on the basis of anything that I have done, that I can't be lost by anything that I will do. Because I need your power, I need your presence, I need to be assured of it in order to carry out what you've called me to do, in order to withstand all the trials of this life. 
I just don't know how you can go through trials in this life without the assurance of salvation. Number five, Jesus' sheep, this is precious here. Jesus' sheep are under Christ's permanent protection. I give them eternal life, the eternal kind, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. No disgruntled relative, no disgruntled employer, no false teacher, no demon. Satan himself cannot snatch a sheep out of Christ's fold. He is the shepherd par excellence. You don't mess with Jesus. You don't mess with his sheep. This is one of the reasons I believe that the doctrine of assurance is so prevalent, the doctrine of assurance is so prevalent in scripture and why it's repeated so often. It's because we are prone to doubt. So here, as elsewhere, Jesus piles phrase upon reassuring phrase in order to ground our assurance. Can Satan or his demons or a false teacher or an angry family member imperil my, my salvation? No. Jesus says that his sheep are under his permanent protection and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. And this ties exactly into his previous promises about eternal life. And his previous promise that he knows you personally and will not let you go. God set his love upon you before the foundation of the world and planned your salvation from eternity past. Your salvation is in his hands, not yours ultimately. In fact, so secure is your salvation that Paul can look at it as if it had already been consummated. This is Romans 8, 29 and 30, another beloved verse by, uh, passage for many of you, I'm sure. It goes like this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Paul is so assured that salvation cannot be lost that he can look at the person who's been justified and say, they've been glorified. They have been glorified. I, again, I just don't know how you can live without this doctrine. I do not know how you can walk around with the belief that you could lose your salvation. Just, what do you do in your life? How do you, how do you persevere through trials Listen to this, other, this next passage. So this is just right after the one I just read in Romans. Listen to how Paul talks about the assurance of our, of our salvation in connection with overcoming, overcoming suffering and persecution. He says this, What shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies no one can bring a charge against God's children. God's already done the justification. Who are you to bring a charge? Who is to condemn? Jesus has already been condemned. Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And here's where it gets right down to the nitty gritty. Because you might be wondering, well, wait, you know, when things really get bad, will I lose my faith? I've wondered about that sometimes. Like, what happens if something really bad happens? Some severe trial comes in. Will I lose my faith? Paul says this, Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And you saw Paul. I mean, that was true about Paul. I mean, every suffering under the sun he endured, right? Yet he kept the faith. He remained in Christ the entire time. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is assurance that brings us through the trials and the difficulties and the persecutions of this life. It's through assurance that we persevere in our trials. It's not without it. It's not by gritting our teeth and being like, I'm just going to get through this. It's actually through the assurance that Christ will not let us go, that God will not let us go. 
there's no trial that you will lose your faith in because God is holding on to you. That's encouraging. There's no trial that's going to rob me of my faith. The Lord will sustain me and he will sustain you. We may get laid low. We may be hurting. It may be severe, but Christ will not let us go. That's the truth of this passage and many others, quite honestly. This is such an abundant teaching in the New Testament. It's hard to make a coherent argument against it, though some have tried. Salvation was designed with the express purpose of providing assurance for Christians. God set his love before, on you before the foundation of the world. He sent his son to fulfill all righteousness in your place. We talked about this. He's done it all. He gives you the spirit to regenerate your heart. And then he provides you with all these promises about the security of your salvation. Why? Because we can't serve fruitfully and persevere faithfully without it. Why do you need assurance? Because we can't serve fruitfully and persevere faithfully without it. If you perpetually lack assurance, and I had to learn this too. I had to learn this the hard way. I was in college. I'd become, I came to Christ at age 19. And about three months into that, I, or I should say I came to Christ and then I transferred schools and I went to the master's college, and it was a delightful time, but very soon into that, I began to struggle severely with the assurance of my salvation. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and I could share that with you another time. But I had to learn this the hard way. I started to think, well, maybe I just don't need assurance. Well, that didn't work out very well, let me just assure you. That did not, I was tossed to and fro for months. We will be perpetually wandering and struggling in this life if we don't have assurance. Hebrews 6.11 says this, and we desire that each of you to show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope until the end. That's God's will for you. Full assurance of hope until the end. Number six, Jesus' sheep are a gift from the Father. This is another important piece in the foundation of our assurance. Jesus' sheep are a gift from the Father. We have to grasp that salvation isn't ultimately dependent upon us. Do we have a responsibility to repent and believe? Absolutely. That's clear in the Bible. Ultimately, our salvation is dependent upon a gracious God. Our assurance, however, will be hindered if we begin to think that salvation is ultimately up to us. And Christ's permanent protection of his sheep are tied to this gift from the Father. Back in John chapter 6, if you were reading through the, the book of John, you would, you would have seen back in John chapter 6, verse 35 and following, that Jesus indicates that his people are actually a gift from the Father, something that the Father has granted to him. And he says it like this. He says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus' mission, and he will not fail in this mission, is to make good on this gift of the Father. Namely, to never lose the one, one sheep out of the entire fold of the gift that God, has, the Father, has given him. Jesus' sheep are a gift from the Father, and he is committed, he is able, infinitely able to fulfill this responsibility to keep this gift safe. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Don't you love the strength of that verse? No one. No one. Think of someone. And Jesus would say, not that person either. Satan? Nope. His demons? Nuh-uh. No one can snatch them out of my hand. I love the strength of that verse. Jesus is saying, no one will mess with my sheep. They are mine. I paid for them. I laid my life down for them. 
and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Well, guess what else? Not only that, but the Father also protects Jesus' sheep. Jesus' sheep are under the Father's permanent protection. That's the next phrase. That's the next phrase. My Father who has given them to me, as we saw, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. So not only are you not able to snatch them out of Jesus' hands, but now you have the Father coming alongside and saying, I will protect them too, and no one's able to snatch them out of His hands. So it's just you step back and, okay, all right, does He mean literally everyone? Yes, literally everyone, as Jesus points out here, the Father who is greater than all. Now just a side note, some have camped out on that verse and said, you see, Jesus is claiming that the Father is greater than he is, that he's not equal to the Father, and maybe you've even had some people knock on your door and talk to you, and they might be from Kingdom Hall, and they might suggest that this is um, a verse that indicates that Jesus is not equal to the Father. Well, the problem with that is the entire Bible, but even more than that, the problem with that is the context (laughs) of this of this passage, of that verse. Who is the Father greater than all in this context? He's greater than anyone who would try to snatch the sheep out of the Son's hand. Jesus is not suggesting that the Father is greater than him. In fact, if you just read on, I and the Father are one. There it is. Yeah, there it is. So just, when in doubt, read on. That's that's the, that is the, uh, that's the moral of the story. No, Jesus is saying that anyone who would attempt to take a sheep, the Father is greater than any of those people. The Father who is greater than all will make sure that the sheep are protected. So aligned are they in this purpose of protecting the sheep that Jesus can say that I and the Father are one, but not just one in purpose. If you were to hear that, in, in Jesus' day, your mind would have immediately hearkened back to what passage in the Old Testament? Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, did the religious leaders take it that way? Were they, did they see Jesus claiming to be equal to the Father? Or am I just blowing this out of proportion? The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And then he responds, well, why are you trying to stone me? Well, we know why they tried to stone him, because he was making a claim to be equal to the Father. So Jesus is clearly saying that he is equal to the Father. The Father protects the sheep. He protects the sheep. The sheep hear his voice. They know, he knows them. He They follow him. He gives them eternal life. They will never perish. No one is able to snatch them out of his hand. No one is able to take this gift from the Father away from him. And not only that, but no one is able to take it from the Father either. The Father and the Son are both protecting the sheep. And these are truths that must make their way into our hearts for us to have genuine assurance. And that's precisely what they're meant to do. The goal of this passage, the goal of the New Testament, is to enable genuine believers to have a rock-solid, unswerving, unwavering assurance that they belong to Jesus. That they know for them there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For us to know with certainty that upon our death we will enter into eternal glory, the likes of which we can't even begin to fathom. That we do not face the judgment of, our, of a creator, but the loving embrace of a father. That we are looking forward to well done, good and faithful servant. That we are looking forward to an inheritance that is beyond anything we could begin to ask or think or even imagine, which then enables us to be generous with our money, with our time, with our lives. Because we can give it all up. See, we weren't meant to muster up obedience by our willpower. We were meant to walk in obedience by faith. Faith is what enables and fuels genuine obedience. When you are sure that heaven is yours, 
you can give it all up. And what a beautiful thing that becomes in the life of the Christian, isn't it? You, you know people like this? They're just, they're, just, they're just, heaven is on their mind. They know where they're going. This life is for the Lord. It's for loving other people. And that is precisely what Christ wants to cultivate in his people with this passage and in the many others that we looked at. Unlike his sheep, the Jewish leaders were without genuine assurance of a right standing with God. Their house was built upon sand, and it would soon topple. They did have an assurance. Remember? John the Baptist nailed this. They had an assurance that they belonged to Abraham. They were Abraham's children. They had a genetic link with Abraham. That was not true assurance of a right standing with God. That's not how you have a right standing with God. It's not an ethnic thing. It's a faith in Jesus thing. And Jesus' followers, on the other hand, experience the spiritual stability of assurance as they hear their Savior's voice, as they follow him, as they believe his promises of eternal protection. Our home, our Christian life is built on a rock and our life is secure in Jesus. So let's go to Jesus now and thank him for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these wonderful truths. Jesus, we thank you for how you encouraged your disciples in the midst of correcting and rebuking the religious leaders. And now we have in our possession precious truths that secure and bolster our assurance of salvation. Help each of us to stare at these verses, to meditate on these verses until we believe them. I pray if there's anyone in here who is not believing, who is not a believer, that you would save them even today. I would pray that if there's anybody in here who is, who is a believer, who is lacking assurance, that you would grant them genuine assurance based on your word. And I pray that those who are walking in assurance, that you would encourage them to keep walking in that assurance, keep walking in obedience and confession and faith and remaining in the body of Christ and remaining in his word. I do pray for each group here that your richest blessing would be upon them. Bless this church. May it be a centerpiece of your glory and your grace. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.